Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we resume that lighthouse tour I started a few years ago and explore a lesser known gem here in the UP. Last year, we got about 2,000 visitors out here. And Brian checked out the National Trappers Association convention over the weekend in Escanaba. We're expecting about seven to 10,000 people here this weekend. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Remember that lighthouse tour I started back in 2019? Then 2020 happened and everything shut down, including lighthouses. A couple years later, they reopened and all of a sudden it's 2023. So I think it's time to resume the tour of UP lighthouses and visit at least a few per year. With 44 lighthouses in the Upper Peninsula, it's going to take a while to get to them all. Here's a quick recap of the ones we visited in 2019. Eagle Harbor, Big Bay, Sichua. Okay, I didn't get very far. But what did those three have in common that the one we visit tonight does not? They were all located on the mainland. This one, you have to visit by boat. It's the Huron Island Lighthouse, located on Lighthouse Island, one of eight small islands that make up the Huron Islands National Wildlife Refuge in Lake Superior, more commonly known as the Huron Islands. The islands are located three miles offshore between the Keweenaw Peninsula and Big Bay. As we neared the island chain, the first thing I thought is their craggy shores look like those of Isle Royal. 30 yards down an overgrown trail, it definitely reminded me of Isle Royal, just on a much smaller scale. There are no moose or wolves here. The only wildlife are the snowshoe hare and some bird species. Lighthouse Island is the second largest island at 40 acres. The lighthouse that stands at the top, 154 feet above Lake Superior, is why I am here today with Bert Mason and Jeff Lohman from the Huron Island Lighthouse Preservation Association, also known as HILPA. HILPA is the ones that are maintaining uh, the lighthouse now in conjunction with Fish and Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife owns all of the islands at this point. Uh, it's still a wilderness area. It's designated as a wilderness area. This island with the lighthouse is the only island that you're allowed to be on, okay? The other islands are off limits to any humans. So the lighthouse was built in 1868. It was to protect the shipping, the navigational channels for the mining that was going on up in the Keweenaw. Uh, there were several boats that actually crashed into the islands before they built the lighthouse. And the idea was to put lighthouses so that you were never out of sight of a lighthouse. The Huron Islands have a colorful, oftentimes morbid and violent history. So the name Huron Islands come because the Hurons were fleeing uh, it's either the French or the British, you know, white people with lots of guns. And so they come into this area and the Anishinaabe, uh, my ancestors said, go out to these islands, hide there, you'll be safe. And so this is where the Huron Indians hid. 
uh, as they were being sought after by a formidable military force. This rocky archipelago was a dangerous location for sailors, and the wreckage from a few ships lay at the bottom of this cold, clear water. But the next island is called Cattle Island, and the reason it's called that is a ship wrecked there with cattle on it, and all the cattle ended up on the island. As the story goes, the people were rescued, but the cattle were left on the island. Even after the lighthouse was built in April 1909, the George Nestor, a schooner, was caught in gale force winds just off Lighthouse Island. The ship smashed against the island and the entire crew perished. These islands are basically granite rocks, billions of years old, the oldest in the UP. You can still see the grooves left by glaciers alongside the lighthouse. The majority of the stone on this, on this lighthouse was actually quarried at the other end of the island. Some of the stone that was quarried was actually used out on Granite Island, out of Marquette, where there is a sister lighthouse that's identical to this one with the exception that they don't have as many pergolas on the, on the roof. It's kind of unique and it's hard to imagine carrying these stones from the other end of the island up here. You'll notice down here uh, where they chipped away forming the stone to get it the right shape to fit in each spot. A quick tour of the inside of the lighthouse shows how it has fallen into disrepair over the years. The inside of the lighthouse is not open to the public. Hilpa's goal is to restore it and someday open it up for people to visit. 2000, Hilpa started doing uh, fundraising and whatnot, and they actually replaced the roof. The roof in this building had failed, and that was the beginning of Hilpa. The organization pulled together to try to preserve this lighthouse as a historic feature. And then off to your right, where the white building is, that was the assistant keeper's building. So that's where the assistant keeper stayed. We're in the process of stripping the paint off of that. It's lead-based paint. Mm -hmm. So we're stripping that off and repainting it, residing it. One of the neat things about this facility here is that everything is still here, mm -hmm. okay? So the, we've got the boathouse and the dock. The dock was replaced, but the boathouse is still there. We've got the oil house, the lighthouse, the privy. We've got the, the assistant keeper's house. At the far end, we got the fog signal building. And when we get down there, you'll see there's a little railroad trestle that brought coal up to help with the fog signal horn. Uh, they use steam engines to, to operate the fog signal horn. So that's one of the things that we feel is so cool about this particular uh, lighthouse system is it's all still here mm -hmm. and we're trying to restore it and make sure that it, it doesn't disappear on us. Of course, restoration isn't free. We work strictly on donations and we do have fundraisers from time to time. We ask for donations. I mean, that's, that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we've got enough money that we're going to re-roof the fog signal building We've got the, the trail cleanup going on. Fish and Wildlife is paying for the, for the uh, assistant keeper's building to be restored on the outside. Like most lighthouses around the Great Lakes, this light has been automated since 1972. The 360 degree views of the islands from the lantern room, though, is breathtaking. Down at that far end mm -hmm. is where the fog signal building is. You can't see it from the lighthouse, but every day the keeper would have to go down and uh, fill up the kerosene in the fog signal to operate it. We hiked the overgrown trail to the other end of the island to the fog signal building. Something about the juxtaposition of wilderness and the relics of human use, concrete stairs and telephone poles, that makes me love this landscape even more. So the poles that you see standing up in different spots was for their telephone. They ran a telephone line down to the boat launch or the boat dock, and they ran another telephone line out to the fog signal building. And uh, you'll see those. The other thing that you'll see along the trail are little square blocks 
with a groove in it, and that was put in place so they could pump the kerosene up to the lighthouse, up to the oil house, so they had a plumbing system for kerosene to get it up. The water they took out of the lake. What the island lacks in wildlife, it makes up for in lichen. According to people at the tribal DNR, this face is covered with lichen, and that lichen, if you put it in ammonia, will turn purple. And that's how they made their purple dye. I won't tell you where they got the ammonia from. This foundation here was for the original fog signal building that was built shortly after the lighthouse, probably uh, 1869, 1870. But they built that, and two years later, the ice from the lake came up and removed that fog signal building. So they built the new one back here, 1890s, and uh, this is the one that we're restoring. The other one is too far gone. <laughs> In 1950, the U.S. Coast Guard took over the operation of the lighthouse and fog signal and added barracks and an oil tank next to the fog signal building. Hilpa plans to remove some of what you see here today. So this building will eventually be taken down as well. The oil tank will be removed out of here. Uh, neither one has historic value. As we mentioned earlier, the rest of the islands are off limits to humans. That's because of the Wildlife Refuge designation. In 1907, Teddy Roosevelt ended up designating that as a wildlife sanctuary, a bird sanctuary, to protect the Huron gulls and uh, the various water birds that were out here. An interesting story is that when he designated this place and all of these islands as a wildlife sanctuary. At that time, the Ojibwa Indians were still coming out and collecting eggs uh, for sustenance. You know, they, they were coming out here and gathering eggs uh, for food. Well, the lighthouse keeper at the time, his nickname was Big Sneed. The fact that it's a bird sanctuary to protect uh, the herring gull, he starts shooting at Indians that are going to the uh, outer islands um, over there to collect eggs. He'd shot at them uh, with a shotgun to ward them off, which is a clear infringement of their right because the treaty was in, fact, in effect by that time, giving them the right to hunt, fish, and gather. Yep, these islands are sanctuaries for herring gulls. As you can see, the pathways built over 100 years ago have been taken over by the boreal forests. Good thing for the work crew today, I happened to visit the same day as the Superior Watershed Partnership traveled to the island for a couple days of trail clearing. My name is Tyler Penrod. I work for the Superior Watershed Partnership as a program manager for the Great Lakes Climate Corps. So the Superior Watershed Partnership's mis mission is to protect the Great Lakes, serve communities and people. And we're based out of Marquette, Michigan, but we serve the entire Upper Peninsula and all three Great Lakes that touch it. With the Great Lakes Climate Corps pro program, we employ over 30 seasonal staff every summer to work on projects like this, as well as other projects across the Upper Peninsula. If this discovering gig doesn't work out for me, I found a summer job I just might like. So we have a grant from the U.S. Forest Service uh, with their landscape scale restoration program, and we were able to offer free days of our crews trail work to different organizations and cities across the Upper Peninsula. And we have two of our Great Lakes Climate Corps crews out here to clear about a mile of trail that stretches from the boat launch to the lighthouse and beyond. Specifically, our crews on this trail are working to expand the corridor. Um, it makes for a more comfortable hike when you don't have branches in your face uh, or just shortly overhead. So we're, we're clearing that corridor to be about four feet wide, which is about elbow width, uh, and then a couple a uh, foot or two feet above the tallest person in the group, so. These islands are a little known gem here in the UP. Last year, Lighthouse Island received about 2,000 visitors. Now visitors can enjoy a clear path to the historic features. There is no camping allowed on the island. 
to my sadness, but the work crews here got to stay the night and I'm extremely jealous. I hope they enjoyed the experience. The annual National Trappers Association Convention was once again back in the Upper Peninsula. I stopped in at the UP State Fairgrounds in Escanaba to check it out. This is the 2023 National Convention in Escanaba, Michigan. This is the third time we've hosted the Nationals and we're, with all indications we're going to break the record that we set in 2014 and 18. We're expecting about seven to 10,000 people here this weekend. It's a three-day show, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And like you and I were talking, Brian, there's something for everybody here. It is an all-around outdoor show. Hello everybody, I'm uh, Tyler Selden. I'm a trapper up in uh, northern, northeastern Alaska and uh, we were invited by the NTA to come down here and attend the convention in Escanaba. Um, we were on the, the television show that was on Discovery Channel for f a few seasons uh, called The Last Alaskans. So yeah, I'd never been to a convention before and um, never thought I'd really have the chance but uh, the Nationals uh, extended an offer and so I came down and getting to meet a lot of a lot of cool people and, and see some new country and um, yeah it's so it's a good good opportunity glad I came we did the first two seasons of the last Alaskans and uh, we you know we were reluctant to do it originally but they explained they wanted to get away from the reality format and they they wanted to do like a documentary style so Haimo and Bob and everybody else agreed to do it, so we thought, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. And they just followed us around with the camera. They, they just, it was real easy. They made, they were real professional people, and they followed us around with the camera. And after a while, you don't even know, recognize it's following you, and you just do your thing. And and they were, they were pretty, pretty accurate on how they did the show. And, we, we were happy with how it turned out, and we, we were happy when we were done, but we enjoyed ourselves while we were doing it, and we're, we're just doing our own thing now. We're back to our normal life, <laughs> doing our own thing you know, without cameras. Three demo areas, one for kids, one for ladies only, and one for everybody. Uh, we have an inside beaver pond with a flowing creek for doing demos, big screen TV so everybody can see what's going on. 550 inside tables, all kinds of vendors, all, anything you can imagine from outdoor artwork to, to uh, turkey calls. And we got 100 and I think it's 135 outdoor vendors. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marty Moyerado. I trap in Alaska. Used to be on a show called Mountain Man. Came down here to uh, the UP to join in on the National Trappers Association convention. Having a great time, a lot, meeting a lot of nice people, talking trapping, just having a good time. And praying for snow so I get back up there and start trapping again. <laughs>
it's a heck of a show. If you didn't make it down here, you missed something great. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.